the art of the subplot. Uh, once, I mean, it, once there were so many subplots, there was hardly a comic left. That was the Claremont days. And, and today there's none. So what happened? Hey there, this is Birch, uh, talking about subplots, and if you look back at the, you know, I always mentioned Claremont, Claremont run, but, you know, DC was kind of uh, notorious for this, some Marv Wolfman uh, stories, and I'm trying to think of others, that uh, Jeff Johns used to do this pretty effectively, I don't know, there's there's a number of writers, uh, Bendis would sort of do this, uh, but he even he has kind of moved away from it, lately. he has kind of background sneaky plots, but they're not really subplots. They're they're kind of background sneaky plots to the main plot. Like they're not, it's not teeing up necessarily other things. It's just teeing up an extension of what you're already doing, uh, which is fine too. This isn't, that's not a knock on business. But uh, subplots were, used to be more of a, a comic thing. And I think part of that is because X-Men was very popular. Claremont was very popular. So you a lot of people trying to copy Claremont. Uh, Scott Lobdell, uh, Chuck Austin, in their runs would do a lot of that. Grant Morrison, there were a lot of kind of the the subplots. And what was nice about Claremont's was, I mean, he would it's like how he wrote. It would be a whole page, like you'd be reading around the comic, and then you'd turn the page, and like the comic would, you know, a little caption at the top be like, "Meanwhile, elsewhere," and then you'd have some shenanigans going on from, you know, a subplot or a villain that's coming up in the uh, in the future. And okay, uh, that's that's what was going on there, and and so and then sometimes you know a, a, an issue of X Men would have like two or three of those, and then you, you're like oh a bunch of things being juggled around. Um, but the the subplots, I think the you know, it's a plea for the lost art of the subplot. Um, I think that the subplot made the comic certainly feel longer, feel like more of a value, because you were getting the story you were reading, and then you were teeing up future stories. So even though it was like a little you know, teaser or trailer for the world to come, it still felt like you're getting a bigger story. You're kind of being reminded that the story you're reading has a lot of legs and it's it's going to be going places. And I think that was pretty powerful. That was a good thing. Um, the to comics today have kind of not, not removed the subplot, but dramatically scaled it back from where it used to be. Uh, there are There are fewer subplots used. There was some some very public statements by a couple editors, and I think Dan Didio at one point uh, had made this comment of just like, "Hey, we're writing for trades. And subplots don't do well in trades. You you have a trade that's supposed to kind of tell a complete storyline or arc, and you don't want to have a bunch of kind of random, you know, pages in there that are teeing up some future event that have nothing to do with the subplot or with the trade." And I always thought that logic was really really questionable because you know, if you, what are you shooting for? If you sell a trade to a customer, you're hoping you're selling another trade down the road, right? It's not like you're selling one trade and then, you know, that's it. Like <laughs> we're only getting one. This customer's coming in, they're only going to buy one trade paperback in their entire life. So let's make it count with this one. It will be the special $14.99 trade paperback of you know miss marvel and they're never coming back for more i mean maybe is that is that what's happening i don't think that's what's happening on any level i mean even if you look at how comics are selling in other places the uh you know even if you look at smile and uh some of the stuff reina telmager does or uh pilkey with dogman which are the two kind of big juggernauts of the you know not trades but comics that are not by Marvel and DC that are, you know, selling way better than Marvel and DC and everything else. Um, you know, a uh, dog man sets up other dog man issues. I mean, not it's, it's written for a younger audience, so it's not doing like deep cliffhangers, but the, the intention of both of those creators is to sell more books. They're not, they're not just selling one and then calling it a day. Their whole deal is that they're going to have an ongoing run of, of books. I mean, the Harry Potter stuff, was written to keep things going. You didn't have like at the end of every issue, every the end of every story of Harry Potter, like, and then everything was solved. You, you just, you know, it was designed to tell a complete story, but it was also designed to tee up the next story. So 
those aren't perfect analogies by any stretch of imagination, but I've always found that questionable in trades where people get really paranoid, like, oh, we can't set up the next trade. We got to be, we can't do that. You know, people could, another one I heard, um, I, I want to credit this with Didio again, but this may not, that may be unfair, was, uh, hey, this, uh, you know, the trades may be read in any order. So we can't do things that disrupt that. You may pick up like, you know, Teen Titans, you may pick up trade number you know, one, five, and eight, and you may read them, you know, five, then eight, then one. And the story has to make sense no matter how you read it. Like, but do they? Like, I, who, 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 in what other medium are we holding things to that standard? It'd be like uh, if Netflix said, hey, we got the new season of uh, Stranger Things out, but we want to make it so that somebody can watch season three first and then season one, and it won't spoil anything for season one. It'll just all be fine. Like no, nobody is saying that, that, that makes no sense, but that is kind of the mood of how these things go. And I think, but I mean, and the other part is I think subplots, not only are they good for selling more comics and teeing up interest in future stories, but I think it's also job security. And I, I mean, now granted, you know, the editors, I think, are on the watch for this to kind of prevent this to some extent. But I've got to believe that a creator coming in, even a freelance creator coming in or an IC, can come into the picture and go, hey, um, I've got this uh, story for my comic. And here's the arc that we're going to do. And we're going to really try and boost sales in this comic. So we're also going to tease a bunch of stuff in the future. So I've got this and this and this. And we're going to start to tease this in the background. and." You know, if my run on the comic continues and we're going to go into this storyline and this storyline, you know, we're really going to try and make sure that we hold up our sales and keep people engaged and and really use the comics to tell a big story, but also advertise the next story. That's what we're going to do. And I've got to believe, although, you know, even as I'm saying this, I realize it's not the case, that only a, a super dumb editor would be like, no, I, those are all great ideas, but we're just going to tell a nice standalone arc for six issues. And if readers buy it, great. And if they don't buy it, then who cares about that too? And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get, I, do you want to go get some coffee? Let's get some coffee. Cause that's the most important. My day is getting some coffee. I, I don't know. I doubt it. I mean, maybe that's what's going on, but I, I don't think so. So if you're an up and coming writer, and you've just landed your gig at one of the big publishers, try adding more subplots in. Try adding more kind of depth into your story. Look, one of two things will happen. Either the readers will appreciate it, sales will go up, and you've got yourself some nice locked-in job security because you've introduced plots that only exist in your head. You know, maybe you've talked them over with your editor, but, you know, that's what Claremont used to do. He would, he would tee up a bunch of stuff in his head. And even though his, you know, he was a very strong selling writer at the time, there's no chance of him getting fired or displaced. Um, you know, you get enough of those subplots spinning, and then you know, when are you gonna, when are you gonna can old Claremont? You're probably not gonna do it because he's got, he'd disrupt a bunch of stories. So on one hand, you, it's job security. On the other hand, if you do get canned, then you get to go and tell your story on panels and conventions and everywhere else you can about how you have all these other subplots that were lined up and then nobody did anything with them or maybe they somebody did and they told the story completely wrong different from how you've been teeing it up so you get to tell that too so either you get the enjoyment of you know having a nice long run with money and job security or you get the enjoyment of you know crapping all over that company later for doing something stupid i mean either way you you've got it's a win for you so i think that's uh you know happy days are here again you should definitely give that a shot um, anyway, I, you know, I, this is like a, in defense of the subplot. Hey, it makes your story seem bigger and more valuable and, and powerful. So, you know, consider doing that, consider throwing in those subplots. They're good for you. Good for the readers. Good for the writer. Uh, good for everyone and put them in the trades. I mean, come on, nobody, no, everybody can figure out what's going on with the trades. Nobody, you know, think higher of your readers. Let's assume your readers are smart. I think that's that's a fair assumption. I mean, they're they're probably smart, and therefore, you know, we can treat them like adults. They'll they'll, they'll figure it out. I think they'll they'll figure it all out. 
I want to throw in a comic here, like, unless they're reading this comic, and then they're, you know, they're, they're, they're stupid. I don't want to do that, though. That's not, that's not fair. That's not, not fair at all to lots of good comics out there that, that are, anyway. Uh, what do you think? Hey, leave me a comment, like, subscribe, hit the bell for notification. Uh, what do you think about the subplot? What's your favorite subplot of all time? Uh, to me, I think the, uh, the very long running, I think there are two, uh, you know, that they did in X-Men both that I thought were really solid. Uh, one was kind of how Mr. Sinister was ultimately unveiled to the, to comics. I thought that was a long kind of running subplot of this guy in the shadows. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, the other is I, uh, same, same thing with the X-Men. I think a lot of what they did with Maddie Pryor kind of right after, and it was tied into Sinister as well, but uh, what they did with her prior to Inferno of this slow corruption uh, the abandonment by Cyclops, how the baby kind of vanished out of the picture, and then her descent into evil. I think that was all pretty pretty awesome, too. There's a storyline in uh, Uncanny X-Men where she fell uh, down into kind of like the Reavers uh, television monitor station, and she got influenced by the demon, and it, it had a picture of you know Jean Grey taking her face and turning her into this kind of faceless dummy. And uh, that was pretty good stuff. That was It was kind of very disturbing writing, but uh, gripping. It was just it was good, it was a solid comic. Um, that, that stuff was nice. I miss those days. Um, plus it was like, it, um, it, it kind of crapped all over Jean in the process. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, Jean didn't come off looking good in that thing. She looked like kind of a, a kind of home wrecker harpy. Uh, that was a, a fun, fun, kind of crazy stuff they were doing with Jean at the time. It was, it was made the villain sympathetic. It's, you can't ask for more than that. Uh, depth is good. Anyway, let me know your favorite storylines, your favorite subplots. We'd love to hear from you. Follow me on Twitter at Comic Perch, and thanks for listening.